Yeah. 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 Ye
and then we multiply those stripes and add them up, and we end up with our matrix C. So we're just writing matrix multiplication slightly different. So here's an example. Oh, by the way, there is something different. I'm not using dark red anymore, so you can actually see the things I'm highlighting. Um, anyway, so this is A, this is B, and then we are uh, subdividing A in this kind of uh, two column uh, stripes, and B in this two row stripes. And then we multiply A0 by uh, B0. And the uh, problem is the example is a bit small. I should maybe switch to a bigger one. But the idea is, so A tells you which linear combination of B you want to write here. Right? So 1, 1 tells you X at the uh, zeros in the first row. Uh, so this is this big guy. And then again, we have 1, 1, so we add it here again. Right? So the idea that emerges because we have very few bits uh, we can simply write a table of all possible combinations of this, so we don't keep adding them, but we only add it once, right? So we construct a table of all linear combinations, and then we use A as a lookup uh, that tells us which row of the table we want to add. Right? That's all. So the algorithm hence looks very simple. Um, we, uh, we run through our stripes, we create all uh, possible linear combinations of these uh, these, these rows, and then we read, uh, we read the, uh, an index from the table by using A, by using the A as lookup, and then we add that row from T uh, to our matrix C, and we're done. But this is, so what this gives you is uh, complexity of uh, n cubed divided by log n. Right? So you're saving log n by choosing your parameters carefully. But this is, of course, not the uh, most efficient way of multiplying two matrices in practice. For dense matrices, uh, the best thing uh, we know uh, in practice is uh, thrust and linear graph multiplication, uh, which gives us this uh, infamous uh, linear algebra concept 2.807 and so forth, so log, uh, log 2 of 7. Uh, and then, so why this, this previous algorithm still is relevant is that at some point we want to cross over from the asymptotic to fast technique to some base case, which is very efficient, and in our case, uh, it's not. Uh, the, the standard triple loop multiplication by m for m is the base case that we use for small dimensions. So uh, I guess like all, like writing the, the high level stress in Vitograd, that's easy and then it was done quite quickly. And then uh, like optimizing this base case is what we spent uh, quite a bit of uh, time on. Right? So that's, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But all, everything, <coughs> always when I talk about these algorithms, they're always base cases of the asymptotic and fast algorithm. Um, so, again, um, the, um, what we are trying to do is minimize memory access, right? And this, this M4M algorithm was designed to minimize uh, arithmetic operations, right? It goes from n cube to uh, long n, but like, um, we can have to better in terms of memory access. So, when we, when we look at this simple algorithm, actually making this table, we're using the same rows of B over and over again. Right? So this is very cheap in terms of memory access. But then, uh, then we go through um, the matrix A and we're reading, so we're storing our matrix in row major already, right? So like it's uh, that, so that um, like the rows are, the edges of the row are like in one vector and then like perhaps there's another vector, um, row vector and then there's another vector. That's kind of how you think about it. Right? So like then we, then we, when we go down uh, the rows of A, uh, loaded index, and then we load something from the table and add it to C. Right? So every time, like for each, uh, for each of these k bits that we're taking care of, in each iteration, we're doing a load from A, we're loading a row from A to get these few bits, and then we're loading, uh, we're loading uh, a row from C, add to one XOR, and store the row from C. Right? So in terms of memory access, that's not good. So um, what we do is simply do this clockwise. Right? So we take smaller parts, and we, uh, we do our m for m algorithm there, and then for the next part, we regenerate those tables. So we're doing strictly more arithmetic operations. Right? We're, doing, we're approaching the classical algorithm. We're taking a step back from the actual m for m trick and say, you know what, let's do more work. Let's do more regeneration of tables, but simply by the fact that make table is cheap in terms of cash, and this is expensive in terms of cash, um, it is more efficient in practice. But we can, we can actually go even further away. So the way this, the story of this is, like, 
Well, there is this, this M4M trick that makes uh, multiplication of a very small finite fields fast, but if you want to implement this efficiently, then you actually have to almost go back to the classical algorithm because it's more cash efficient. It's one way of thinking about this. Right? And then again, right? memory is uh, uh, arithmetic operations, they're really cheap, uh, and memory access is expensive. So let's uh, right. So there's this hierarchy of caches in your CPU. L1 is the fastest. So we try to uh, get as much uh, many gray point tables into L1 because that's the stuff we can work on efficiently. So let's, let's say, for example, we have a, a, a window width or a, a stripe width of 10, uh, and then that means we like, and we do one gray point table. That means in uh, in one iteration we take care of 10 bits. Right? Or we do a uh, width of 9 and do two gray code tables, which still takes the same memory, right? because it's all uh, 2 times 2 to the 9 is 2 to the 10. Um, but we can deal with 18 bits, of course. Right? But uh, the problem, of course, now is we have to do additional XOR. There's not one big table, but we have two tables and we have to add them. But an XOR is really cheap. Right? So uh, the algorithm simply is we, uh, we take 2K. Uh, we generate two tables, we read two indices, we add two things. That's the whole thing. It really is the others. Right? But because it is all about cache access, this is a lot faster than just doing a good one table. So once you, uh, in our implementation, what we do is eight tables. Um, and there isn't much of a difference between four and eight. So uh, we didn't try 16. Um, so, and then this is what the performance that you end up with. Right, so red, unfortunately you might not be able to see this as well, but it's roughly the same as the green one, is the magma implementation, which uh, Adam Steele did a very good job of implementing multiplication of matrices over G of 2. Uh, and then the other one is, is our implementation. And that is uh, on my uh, computer. Um, and then like, um, which, oh okay, it's work in progress, but it, it's not really work in progress, it's work I guess. Um, so for small matrices, it was mentioned uh, yesterday. Um, so we uh, we do we have quite a bit of uh, data structures around the matrices to support really large things, right? So for instance, if your malloc doesn't support uh, giving you 100 gigabytes, but it gives you it's happened to give you 100 times one gigabyte, so that's that's something you can do. Uh, so this but this is overhead, right? This is this is uh, stuff you have to do, and that really hurts when you are. Uh, when you're trying to do uh, matrix multiplication for very small matrices like 64 by 64, which is something Emmanuel cared about, and he's like, oh, this M4I library, that is supposed to be fast, so let's try it. And uh, so this is after he sent us an email and said, like, you guys suck badly, you didn't it that way. Um, and then, so, like, we, we went ahead and actually optimized that, but we were much, much worse. Right? But you can see, like, we didn't really spend that much time on additions because it's ridiculous that our addition takes a lot more time than our additions. Uh, sorry, our multiplications. <laughs> but this is, this is kind of something we have to be more careful about the, uh, the, the small matrices. Um, and so we have to, there's time that uh, we have to spend time uh, and fix this. And this is, I thought I took this out. So this Carlo Wood guy, he, uh, he worked a lot on improving this stuff. And I think our transpose is actually a lot faster now, but um, sorry about that. So I think I would just like because he spent like this guy popped up on our mailing list, uh, and then he, he wrote this incredible transpose code, which I think made it a lot faster than what uh, what, uh, what we have there, uh, and then he disappeared. So he's not working on this anymore. He, he's gone. He did. He, he he gave us the gift of, of fast transpose. Right, and then so, but if you, then the question is, okay, so if there's this faster 64 by 64 multiplication, uh, why don't we just use that as a building block, and then, you know, like our library for larger dimensions would also be faster, and so um, it depends on how you look at it, whether you gain something from it, right? So um, the, uh, the yellow line is, let's take the best we can do for 64 by 64, and let's just scale this up, let's just do Strassen on top of that. And if you just say, well, I'm only counting multiplications, then indeed you would do better, right? You would, uh, you would do a lot better. But as you have seen, um, so essentially, at these dimensions, an add costs you about as much as a multiplication. 
in, that, in those sizes. Uh, if you actually account for the first level, you also count the multiplications, the performance you end up with is pretty much the same as we get uh, in magma and in M4I. Right, so um, it's, it's not, I find it relatively convincing that the strategy of just moving to this 64 by 64 blocks and then just doing that wouldn't uh, actually dramatically improve performance. Right. Uh, let's move on to elimination, so like Gaussian elimination, because that's what we care about in this workshop, I guess. Uh, this is, uh, so the way we do this is PLE decomposition. Um, so, you know, uh, every matrix you can write, like you, you have an echelon form on the, on the uh, upper right, and you have a transformation matrix on the lower left, uh, which is a lower triangular, uh, unit lower triangular, and then you have a permutation matrix, which you can store as a vector, and then you, uh, if you multiply this up, then you get back uh, your original matrix. Right, so, you can, that's, so we're using this decomposition uh, to uh, compute measure performance. Um, and then from the PLE, you can read ranks and row rank profiles, which is something that we care about when we compute Krippner basis. Uh, you can compute null space, you can solve, and you can compute the reduced rash one form efficiently. And then actually the PLE, or COP, if you look at everything transposed, uh, like Arne is doing in uh, this paper, then, uh, then this paper kind of tells you, like in terms of the leading constants of complexity, uh, PLE or CUP is, is what you want to do. But there's one complication, I forgot which one it is, where you get a slightly worse complexity if you do that instead of another algorithm. But for almost all things you want to com compute, like computing the PLE first is the way to do it. Um, it's a very nice paper, so like this uh, efficient linear algebra, dense linear algebra was a bit of a black art, and it's like, uh, you know, there was this paper there, there was this paper there, and they talk to the right people, and then you look at this this way, and this is the nice way, so this is how all these different decompositions are related, this is the leading constants, it's, um, it's very nice. So if you work on efficient dense linear algebra, uh, then you should definitely read this paper. <coughs> Right, so how does this look like uh, to do this, uh, the block recursive decomposition and this, uh, like all these asymptotically fast algorithms, they reduce to uh, fast uh, matrix uh, products. So you do a recursive call on the left hand side and you call the PLE decomposition there. So, um, and then you do an update on the right hand side. That's why we compute the transformation matrix, right? So we can do uh, a triangular solve uh, for the right hand side. Uh, then we do an update on the lower side like, uh, to uh, update uh, this. Uh, we do another PLE uh, on that part, and then we compress that. Um, so, um, uh, right again, um, we are uh, right. We like this is the the asymptotically fast technique. So. Uh, Again, we would like to, like, this is a bunch of recursive calls. So at some point, we end up with uh, a matrix um, that, um, where we don't want to do recursive calls, so we need a base case. And again, we want to, uh, want to do, uh, have that to be efficient. Uh, one way to think about the base case is to think about that previous algorithm, but instead of cutting in half, you're cutting into uh, smaller blocks, so you're not doing a block recursive version but a block iterative version, if you then use the M4M algorithms for the update, then you will end up with uh, something that has n cubed divided by log n complexity again. Um, and then another way of looking at this, you take uh, Gregory Bard's M4I algorithm, which gave name to our library, and you uh, uh, message it long enough so it gives you the PLE, then you arrive at the same thing. Um, so uh, again, so how does this look like? And here's a here's a special special thing. Um, so if you just like if you were to do the, the block iterative decomposition, that gray bit would extend all the way down, right? Because that's that's how the algorithm uh, works. But we want to be cache efficient. So uh, what we do is like if by by chance we found uh, a full rank already, we stop. So we're only computing this far, um, and then we do the update. And then we do the update below and this update. And the, the, why this is cache efficient is because we can do these two steps in one go. Right? Because these are stored as one row. So as we update this guy, we can also update this guy. So we only have to touch it once instead of twice. Um, so that makes things faster. 
Right? But of course, if we didn't find uh, a pivot, then we have to go all the way down. Right? Uh, and in which case, um, we then uh, just do the normal updates uh, and end up with the PID transition. Right, and then again, uh, performance. Uh, as you can see, here we are uh, a bit faster than MACMA, and I believe that um, MACMA implements LQP instead of uh, PID. Uh, and I also think that uh, Alan's base case doesn't take care of these uh, caching checks, known as Conrod's uh, method, uh, for decomposition, but uh, I don't know any specifics about the magma implementation. Um, I should mention for the matrix modification, we do know specifics because Alan kind of gave us a bit of details about this implementation, so we can also compare strategies there. It's more than that. Right, so then, uh, so what you end up with is like the leading constant is 6.8 and minus 12 on this machine or 4.3. So you get that kind of constant split. And so what does this mean? So if you want to do like a half a million by half a million uh, for a dense random matrix, then you can do this in uh, roughly three hours. If you do one core, and if you do, uh, how many if I use uh, four cores, uh, you can do this in one hour. Um, and the, 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 why I couldn't try bigger examples is because I was running out of RAM, right? So like the, 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 it's very efficient, and then the RAM is really um, that usually you you are happy to wait an hour, but like, you're not happy to like, have spent 200 gigabytes. Right. So gravity based computations a little bit. So the first caveat is so these algorithms are designed to be rank sensitive. So if you have a lower rank, you do less operations. The way this is achieved is by, like, if you if you find uh, columns where you couldn't find the pivot, you compress them, right? So you do less, you do less operations. Well, compressing, like, swapping columns in matrices of a GF2 that you store bit packed is not that efficient. So uh, you actually, like, these column swaps, they can kill you. And as you can see, um, they do kill us. Um, so. When we started out, like our curves were like twice as high as magma's, right? So like that, that magma looks like this is not something. Oh, he must be doing something really, really wrong. It's just like if you don't spend a lot of time optimizing this, then this is how your curves look like. And then we, we worked uh, quite a bit on, on making this more efficient, but still you can see if you run the PLE decomposition, then uh, it's just the uh, there's there's a lot of overhead for sparse matrices. And then if you run the M4I algorithm, which is this chrome uh, uh, trick plus Gaussian illumination, so it's not asymptotically fast, but actually for sparse matrices, you're doing better. Um, so why is this? Uh, as I mentioned, they're rank, uh, sen uh, meant to be rank sensitive, and uh, swapping uh, columns is expensive. Uh, and then when you, when you search for pivots, you actually, you, you, like most of our operations, they, they deal with 64 bits or 128 bits at a time. Right, because like you do just an XOR of the words. But when you're looking for pivots, you really ask about the, uh, the bits. Right, so uh, you have to go down to the bit level, which is more expensive. And of course, we lose cache efficiency, right? because we're doing less arithmetic operations per cache load and cache store. So uh, like, um, we still do uh, the same. Right? So like, we're losing the uh, efficiency. Right, and then, uh, so uh, I started actually uh, in, uh, in Raleigh uh, last year. I started uh, um, um, to implement this, uh, this, this specialized algorithm that takes, uh, takes advantage of the structure of the Gripner basis. Uh, and then, so like, I wrote this little program that uh, like you give it a 1-bit PNG, which is your matrix, and then it runs either the PLE, the M4I, or this GB algorithm. And it reads, uh, and then like you can plot intermediate matrices to look at them. Um, so this is like a very simple uh, command that it thinks against the MRI lab library and it uh, runs this uh, this stuff. So um, so you can compare. And the algorithm uh, is as a uh, it's it sounds less stupid when I write very simple variant, but actually it was based on a misunderstanding of mine of the algorithm, and I will show you what my misunderstanding was in a minute. And it's based on, on this trick uh, that is uh, was published in this uh, it was, uh, Fauger and Machard paper, and then there's also this trick was also implemented in Polybory. Uh, I don't know when, but I uh, quite a while ago. Uh, I think Michael will be talking about this in a bit. 
right? And so like what this does, so this is the actual code, right? Um, so you can see a bit of the actual code from the library. Uh, so it runs this function that analyzes and, and tries to find these trivial pivots. Then we do then we do the row swaps to put them in the right order. Uh, and then actually we keep on we keep on swapping the stuff um, as good as we can. And then we, we, we uh, compose our matrix, uh, run the tier uh, upper left solver, uh, then update the lower hand side, then uh, and then finally call the uh, dense uh, normal echelon form on, on, on the rubber part. Right, so I guess what this guy also is meant to say, look like some algorithms you can implement very easily in this library because it looks so nice. Right, and so this is how this looks like. So this is, I think, an HLB example. And this is the input matrix. As you can see, I think uh, uh, non-zero entries should be black and zero entries should be white. Uh, and then so we sort this. Um, to have like these uh, trivial, um, trivial pivots, and here you can see my misunderstanding. So the way I did, I did, I don't do any anything with the columns. So I just try to find the the biggest uh, full rank matrix on the top left, and then I stop. And I'm not doing this uh, this trick of saying, okay, so if, if we have a gap in the uh, in the trivial pivots, then we uh, take that column out and take that row out, and then uh, still have it. Uh, upper triangular uh, matrix there. So that's why the performance is uh, partly that's why the performance is so much worse than the other short times in the bit. Right? And then so uh, you do this uh, you do this update, you do this update below, uh, now you can't see it's a diagonal matrix and then we do uh, the solving down there. And then I guess so this is this is the output of the algorithm so that it generates these images for you so you can see what happens. Right, and so like, how does this look like? Uh, so these are a bunch of matrices. You can download them from my website. Uh, for um, they are all from Polybory, except for this Newton thing, which is from one version of the Newton XL algorithm. Um, so um, and then there's so, like I run the PLE, the asymptotically fast decomposition, then the M4I algorithm, then this GB algorithm that I need to fix, and then Lila. And so what you can see is, so when we are talking about really computations that are uh, in our world kind of trivial, like 10k by 10k, then it seems um, they're doing a bit better than Lila, but that might be because I'm doing uh, non-reduced row echelon forms and Lila does reduced row echelon forms. So maybe, like I haven't tested, but for, uh, push changes that allow me to, to uh, compare better but maybe Lila would, um, but it, I mean, it's always at most a factor of two, so perhaps that is precisely why Lila is slightly uh, slower for this. Uh, but then, when you when you talk about like action matrices where you care how long it takes, like you can see quite a tidy improvement, right? So like 530, 580, and then uh, 520. So you get do a bit better with my GB, but because I stop so early, as soon as I hit the first gap. Uh, I don't really exploit the structure of the matrix, whereas Lila does, and so uh, it's like uh, five to six times faster. So that's a kind of nice, uh, a nice uh, kind of showcase of like, yes, uh, this 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 was worth implementing. Um, and just one word of caution: so like for the mutant <coughs> thing, Lila does a lot worse uh, than our implementations, but because the output isn't really from a Gripner basis algorithm, so I wouldn't put too much weight on this. The matrix looks a bit funny. So it is actually an upper triangular matrix. And then the, um, a bit of weird, uh, very few columns that are not in this shape. And so the whole solving business is perhaps a bit uh, too much. So um, <coughs> the M4I on this is relatively efficient. It seems to be from now on, it does appear on the matrix. And the, the size. Uh, what the depends? The, the efficiency. Okay. In, in efficiency of um, the last one is very strong. Yes, but like look, this one is also less fast. But like uh yeah, but this one Yeah but yeah but you said like so it does depend on the size. If you take a very small one then um, it's just very I mean like yeah, we like so this is but well, we need to uh, need to 
check that uh, run more experience in the college things. But I, I guess the lesson I take away this is very encouraging, right? So like you can you can see a huge speed up. And so what I have to do is implement that algorithm properly in MPRI so we can learn how much does it really depend on the sparse data structures and how much does it depend on the why which would be uh, interesting to so, so, far the data comes in. Right, so how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Right, small extensions. Bam. Um, uh, this is kind of the same advertisement sl uh, slide as before, but it's now about the Marie library. Uh, so it does degrees up to 10. Uh, 16 is planned. Health is very much welcome, and it does all these things that uh, you expect it to do. Uh, we can represent elements in two ways, uh, either as, uh, as polynomials, uh, modulable and non polynomial. So uh, if we do this, then uh, we can uh, we sometimes identify uh, these polynomials with integers, right? So like uh, uh, these bits, we write them as bit strings, and then we can identify them with these final field elements or with integers. And that's our data type MZT, where we pack several of those into one machine word. Um, and here, of course, because we pack them into one machine word, addition is not very cheap, but scalar multiplications are good um, And then the other way around is we, um, we think of uh, GF matrix over GF to the E as, uh, as polynomials uh, with matrix coefficients. Um, and then for each degree, we store the uh, GF2 matrix, uh, which holds coefficients for that degree. And so there's this MZD slice T data type, uh, which just stores vectors of uh, four I matrices uh, over G2, so we can just re immediately reuse the M4I data structures and stuff. And again, additions are cheap, and scalar multiplications are somewhat expensive, so we want to avoid scalar multiplications. Right, so here's an example. We have this matrix of uh, G2 to the 8, uh, sorry, G, uh, G8. Uh, and then, so if we, if we pack this, then we just write bits. Um, um, in, in, in our words, and then but we uh, we didn't implement G2 to the 3, but uh, G2 to the 3 is internally represented as, as 4 bits uh, because like, we don't, didn't want to write code for every single bit, so we only wrote code for the uh, uh, powers of 2 bits, and then uh, always wrote this as a tuple um, of G2 matrices. Um, and then uh, the, the idea is really simple, and uh, perhaps this audience can tell me how this is properly called, so I have a funny name for it. Um, so, right, so we do a matrix multiplication like this, uh, you all know, and as I said, like addition is really cheap, and this multiplication is quite expensive, but they only to the possible multiples of uh, bi, right? So, um, yeah, um, so this, this step that is actually expensive, there are not that many different choices we have. Uh, so what we do is, well, you know, before we run through this, we just create a table of all possible multiples, then we use uh, A, J, I as a lookup, and we add something from our table, drop that. Um, so it's a simple pre-computation table, that's all. Um, and then you can you can extend this to garden elimination, like in the uh, in the usual way, like you take a pivot, you compute all possible multiples, and it boils down to uh, XOR in the main view. Right, so uh, I, I call this Newton John tables, uh, but like, you know, like they probably, like because the idea is so simple, somebody must have implemented this before, so there must be, uh, like, uh, maybe they're just pre computation tables. Anyway, uh, the, now the official, because it was accepted at ISAC, so the name now is Newton John tables. It's named after Olivia Newton-John, who is an actress who did an excellent job in the film Grease, because the MRI trick is often also referred to as greasing. Um, right, okay, so then the, uh, the other data type is uh, polynomials over G2 matrices. So what we do is uh, we do polynomial multiplication. So uh, we want to uh, move, we split our matrix into uh, this polynomial. Then we compute C, we do modular reduction, so we end up with this guy here, and then the last expression can be written uh, uh, slightly more clever, which costs us three multiplication for additions for uh, F2. And uh, because I'm running out of time, I'm not going into uh, too much of the detail, uh, but that's pretty much the other trick. 
Uh, and then if you just put all this together, then, uh, then you end up with these timings. So 4,000 by 4,000 matrices, uh, magma to 15. If you try magma to 18, it, the timing should be better because up until here, Alan implemented the current super multiplication as well. And then, but up until here, he didn't. And in GF2, um, magma to 18, he did. But I don't have magma to 18 yet, so I, I don't know like uh, um, what the timings would look like. And then there's GAP, which I believe was the best implementation before uh, we started working on this. And this is the stress and vinograph on top of this new John tables business, which, as you can see, already uh, um, is, is quite a bit faster, to our surprise, than uh, the two previous implementations. Then this column tells you, well, how many multiplications over GF2 could I do in the same time? So this is, this is quite a big number. This column tells you, well, how many do I have to do if I look at them as polynomials? This then gives you this, the time of our implementation that does this. And this then tells you how close we are to that number, right? So like for, uh, for quite a few, we're relatively close. So it's supposed to take like 17 and we take 18.8. So there's a bit of overhead and perhaps we should look into that, how to fix this. But like um, we do achieve quite a bit of speed up um, compared to this one. And you can play the same game for reduced rational forms. Uh, here, uh, I stopped timing gap at some point because it was just getting too slow. Uh, there's nothing special in the gap, it's just about uh, cubic Gaussian elimination. And then here you can really see like, uh, that the, the lack of um, this um, uh, Karatsuba trick in, in magma really starts hurting at, at uh, degree 5. Um, I compare with Limbox 116 mod p, so that gives you an idea of the workload. So this is of course not the same computation, but it, uh, I take a prime that is close to uh, the field of the uh, um, of the like um, the size of the finite field, so you get an idea of like so if I would do this mod p where we have efficient implementations, what could you expect there? And as you can see, for the degree up to which we implemented the Karatsuba trick, this is quite a bit faster. But then uh, and then here we didn't implement this. So this is this is not asymptotically fast. This is the uh, this is cubic. Um, cubic Gaussian elimination because we didn't implement uh, for these last two degrees uh, the asymptotically fast technique. So uh, mod p in inbox of course is faster, but, but quite surprisingly um, uh, magma is, is doing not so well there. I guess like there's just no special code for this case in magma. Right, and then again a similar plot. So but this is the plot where we didn't spend much time on improving the sensitivity to sparsity. And then again, there's this non asymptotically fast technique to Newton John and the PLE decomposition. Also, um, like, uh, you have a quite similar plot, right? You have this kind of behavior, and then you have this really huge uh, jump at the top uh, for PLE. But what is kind of nice is I think the worst PLE does is as bad as Newton John for uh, full range But maybe that's just how, how bad the Newton John approach sucks. Anyway, thank you very much. Somewhat efficient, but uh, and I can just like so let's see what I can do. So that's that was my problem. But like people are working on this this year, like we can actually here's a more efficient linear algebra. What are the effects on actual So why do you choose to develop a new algorithm as opposed to include this in the existing? Uh, so because you have two library, no? Yeah. Well, I, um, right, so A, I'm a C programmer, not, not very good at C++, um, and uh, Limbox just seemed uh, very scary and big. Uh, um, and
and then also so the Mary library I inherited from Gregory Barth, so he started his own library, so I took over. And then the Marie library was just like felt like yeah, let's just have small libraries that uh, that that are, that, are, that are good at one thing and they're dedicated to a particular task, and so people don't have to uh, kind of in, like build these huge projects uh, when they just need this particular library. I mean, you could argue whether Marie and Mary should be separate libraries. I don't know. But like it seems people are appreciative of the fact that Mary is, is a standalone library. Like I, I, I do get emails from from people who use this because they want to use very like you know this this does this one task and does this one task well and then it, but it's not like it's very clear what it does it's very small and dedicated. We appreciate it very much. For instance, Mary doesn't have any dependencies. Thank you, speaker again. 